national very, courtesy back and forth. So, Dr. Eastbrook, welcome to the committee, and I will turn it over to you in just a little ground rules. During our work sessions, we try to keep it uh, a bit more informal so people can ask questions uh, because we consider this a learning opportunity for the committee here to be able to understand uh, what's going on and what you're presenting. So there will be a bit more informal. We'll stop for questions as people have them going through. That's fine. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm open to any and all questions at any time. Um, let me start by uh, saying that uh, I'm happy to be here and share the information that I have with the committee. I have a lot of data, probably more than you want to know, uh, and a lot of it is in graphic form. And uh, what I will do is I'll show you the factual data uh, for some of the assertions that are in uh, Senate Bill 5502. And to do that, uh, I'm relying on some uh, sayings of our astronauts, uh, which you see on the screen, in God we trust, all others send data. Uh, so I'm bringing data, and I don't ask you to believe any opinions that I may have. You'll, you'll hear very few opinions from me. What you'll see is a lot of data, and I hope that the data is clear enough so you can make up your own minds, and I, you, won't, you won't need to, to ask what my um, opinion is. Uh, whoops, let's go back one. Um, to begin with, uh, I need to uh, say who I am, primarily because there has been a lot of politics injected into science these days. And so uh, I am simply um, a geologist with uh, 50 years of expertise in and research in global climate change all over the world. Uh, I'm a lifelong environmentalist. Uh, I am a scientist. I'm not political. I don't have any particular bias towards either party, so I have no political agenda. I'm not associ associated with or funded by any business group. I'm not a shill for big oil, big coal, big anybody. All of my research has been funded by governmental agencies. And I'm currently working uh, actively with an international group of geologists, atmospheric physicists, meteorologists, astrophysicists, oceanographers, and sea level experts, and other sciences in, in various parts of the world. Now, that's where I'm coming from. I thought I might start by um, listing some things that you probably don't know about or haven't heard about because the news media isn't telling you. And I've listed a few of them here, there are a lot more, but some things that I will touch on later uh, in the presentation. Uh, and that is the global warming ended in 1998. That may come as a surprise, but I'll show you the data for it. And it is indeed true, and that has been admitted by the chairman of the UN group that has been pushing uh, CO2 as causing climate change. Even he admits there's been no global warming in 15 years. Uh, the Antarctic ice sheet is not melting. Contrary to headlines, you'll see about every other day that the Antarctic ice sheet is melting at an accelerating rate. It not only is not melting at an accelerating rate, it's not melting at all. The main ice sheet, and I'll show you the data for this, uh, is in fact growing, not melting. So we don't need to fear that the uh, ice caps are going to suddenly melt and cause all kinds of problems for us, because they aren't. Sea level uh, is been rising globally and also locally at a rate of about seven inches per century as we are thawing out from a little ice age which occurred about 500 years ago. And the projections are anywhere from five feet to 20 foot rise of sea level, uh, as you'll see when I present the data, uh, is, is uh, beyond reality. Snowfall is not below normal. There have been headlines from time to time about in the Cascades, um, certainly, that the snowfall in the Cascades is diminishing because of global warming. That's not true. For the past five years have set snowfall records, both uh, globally and in the Cascades. Um, CO2 cannot possibly cause global warming. That will come as a shock to you, I'm sure. And the reason is that there's so little of it. Uh, it is a trace gas. It has increased uh, in its atmospheric content by only eight one thousandths of one percent. If you double nothing, you still get nothing. And I'll, I'll comment more about this lately, uh, later. Uh, severe storms are not more frequent uh, than um, normal. When we get a big snowstorm in the east, they say, oh, it's because of global warming. When we hear about a, a hurricane on the east coast, they say it's because of global warming. Uh, it isn't. Uh, and I will show you data that shows that actually the extreme events, severe storms, are actually declining. They're not, they're, they're not becoming more frequent. And uh, finally, you may be surprised to know that the oceans are not acid. Oops. Uh, Mr. Chair? One second. Let's, uh, you want to go back? 
I think Senator Anker has a question. Oh. I'll have several later, most of them I'll wait until the end. Just on that last point, the oceans are not acid. Are you saying that ocean acidification does not exist, or are you saying the oceans entirely are not acid? I think all of us would agree with that. Nothing is an acid, so. The what, oceans what are not acid. Uh, 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 pH, which is a measure of acidity, uh, is um, a measure on a scale, and 7 is neutral. The oceans have a pH of 8.2, which is alkaline, not acid. And I'll show you why they are not going to become less alkaline, much less more acid, uh, with increasing uh, temperature change, if that, in fact, were to happen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to clarify my question, and I'll be a little clearer here then, uh, do you believe that ocean acidification exists in the world's oceans today and here in the Northwest? No. I'll show, I'll show you the data. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this in detail. If, if, you, if you'd like to wait till I get to those slides, it'll be clearer, I think. Gladly. Thank you. It's very clear, and, and I'll, show you, I'll show you the data. <coughs> so. What I did was I looked at specific issues that formed the basis for Senate Bill 5802, and I listed six of them. And so what I did was I pulled out data that relate to all six of these premises that are uh, inherent and formed the basis for Senate Bill 5802. Uh, regardless of, of the language of the bill, this is what uh, the bill was based on um, as, of, as of this weekend. Um, and I'll, I'll, you're going to read them, but emissions of greenhouse gases is the principal cause of climate change. A lot of data, I'll show you that. Sea level is rising at an increasing rate because of global warming. That's not true. I'll show you the data. Frequency of severe storms is increasing because of global warming. That's not true. Reduced winter storm packs and decreased summer stream flow is not true. Increasing acidification of the state's marine waters. That may or may not be true in terms of the, of the state's marine waters. Certainly it's not true of the oceans globally. Uh, and finally, the production of more electricity from renewable energy while phasing out coal-powered electricity uh, generation. I'll just uh, show you some data that shows what, what this would cost and uh, without commenting on whether coal plants are, are good or not. I'm not particularly um, in favor of coal-powered generation, but there are some numbers you might be interested in. So let's take these one by one. The first one is that greenhouse gases from human activities. Dr. Easterbrook, Senator, Senator Anker has another question. Can you go question. back to the last slide? I, I didn't understand what your point number six was trying to get at. I, I heard you mention coal, that you're not necessarily in favor of coal-fired generation. What's, what's your point there? What are you going to tell my, us my about? My point is to show you, show you the relationship between coal-powered generation and other forms of electricity generation, uh, how much of it is from each of these categories, and what the cost of each is, and and what, the, what changing from one to another might involve. I have no opinion on that. I'm just going to show you some numbers. And how that relates, to, sorry, Mr. Chair, and how that, how that relates to climate. Or you're just going to show us the costs on the generation. Uh, I'm, I'm just, well, it relates to climate because the rationale for moving from one form of energy generation to another uh, is climate. Is how much CO2 you put in the atmosphere. If that's not a, a, a realistic um, assertion, then it doesn't matter. Uh, but if it is, then there is a there is a concern that it's related to climate. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. So let's look at uh, greenhouse gases. Um, but before I do that, uh, let me say something about global warming. Um, there's nothing new about global warming. Uh, it goes on all the time. It has been going on for thousands of years at much higher rates, much more intense for longer periods of time than we've experienced in the last uh, period of global warming since CO2 began to be elevated. Uh, this graph shows temperature on the, on the left-hand side and the date year uh, on the bottom. And what you will see is that um, there was a period of cooling from 1880 to 1915. Temperatures were going down. This is a, a global record. And then from 1950 to 1945, the climate warmed. And then it cooled again from 1945 to 1977. And then it warmed again from 1977 to 1999. And since 1999, it has cooled slightly. Not a lot, but slightly. So what does that mean? Well, if we go back to the warming that occurred from 1915 to 1945, shown by this curve here, global warming occurred without any 
increased CO2 in the atmosphere. This was before the big surge of uh, CO2 emissions after World War II in 1945. So if you want to uh, put a, a mental uh, line in 1945, that's the breaking point between increasing CO2 and, and insignificant changes in CO2 prior to that. So this warming took place prior to increased emissions that occurred after 1945 and cannot possibly be ascribed to CO2 as a cause. Cannot be. And then in 1945, global emissions begin to escalate very rapidly. And for 30 years, um, as the escalation continued, and we put more and more CO2 in the atmosphere every year, we had 30 years of global cooling. So the question then is, if we've had escalating CO2, which is supposed to cause global warming, why did we have global cooling during the initial period when CO2 was escalating so rapidly? It doesn't make sense. And then finally, there was a period from 1978 to 1998 when global temperatures rose again and, and CO2 was still rising. CO2 has been rising throughout this whole, whole interval. So there's only one period when CO2 was rising at the same time the temperature was. And we can take that back uh, even farther. If we go back 500 years, this graph shows essentially uh, temperature on the uh, left-hand side and the year AD on the bottom. Each one of these red peaks is a warm period. Each one of the blue peaks is a cool period. Climate is not constant. It's changing all the time, and it changes in cycles. Uh, warm, cool, warm, cool, warm, cool with about a 30-year um, uh, time span between each one. So we could count these uh, warm periods, and we can count 20 periods of global warming and global cooling that have occurred in the past 500 years, none of which could possibly have been caused by CO2 because CO2 had not begun to rise until 1945. In other words, we have an instance here of 20 periods of global warming, similar to what we've experienced in the period from 1990, 1978 to 1998 that could not have been caused by CO2. They were caused by natural causes. That's important. 20 periods of global warming that can only be ascribed to natural causes in the last 500 years. If we go back even farther, if we go back 10,000 years, uh, this is temperature on the right hand, left hand side, sorry, it's not labeled, and uh, these are years before present on the bottom. Um, the red curve you see here, are these are temperatures that are higher than the present temperatures. And so this is 10,000 years ago at the left hand side, this is present on the right hand side. Look how much of the last 10,000 years the temperatures have been higher than they are now. Almost all of the last 10,000 years, except for the period beginning about 1,300 years ago, almost all of that, the temperatures on Earth were actually warmer than they are right now. This is, warming is nothing new. As a matter of fact, it's the norm for the last 10,000 years. The blue periods here are from the Little Ice Age, which was a period of global cooling that occurred from about 900 AD um, and may still be going on uh, for, for all we know. So what about all the claims in that temperatures are warmer now than they have ever been? These are apparently not true. And they come, those claims come from manipulation of data. Uh, here is the, the real original data. Uh, the hottest year of record, uh, number one for the number of, um, this is the number of um, temperature records that were broken, number one is 1936. Everybody has acknowledged that 1936 was the warmest period, warmest year of this century, until NOAA and NASA began to manipulate the old data and made it cooler. And then they elevated the recent temperature, made them warmer, and so they come up with a headline saying, oh, it's warmer now than it was then. This is the original data before they manipulated it. Uh, you'll see that if, if we take the, the top, uh, top 10, number two was 1934, uh, three was 1939, four was 1931, uh, five was 1930, uh, six was 1933, seven was 1938, and guess what? They're all in the 1930s. 1930s was the hottest decade of the century. Not the present, not the last decade, but the, the hottest of century. Also. Over here, you look at all these 2,000. 
these are all second tier, 10, 11 through 20. This is what the present temperature has been doing, and it's nowhere close to the, to the other. And if you plot that data, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is a number of temperature records that were broken in any given year. These are years down here. So here we are right here, and now we're breaking somewhere around 2,000 records, temperature records for warmth. And you think, wow, 2,000, that's a lot. But look at what it was doing in 1936 and 1934, 10,000. We are, we are setting record highs at a rate of about only a fourth of those that occurred in the 1930s. Dr. This is hard okay. data. Uh, you can question? No, go ahead and finish the slide, then we'll have a question. Pardon me? Go ahead and finish the slide, then we'll have a question. Oh, I'm essentially finished. The, the, the point here is that the 1930s were the warmest decade, and there were 10,000 uh, temperature records set in, the 19, in, 19, in two years, in 1936 and 1934, and we're setting now records somewhere in the world at a rate of about a fourth of that, about 2,000. Great. Senator Ranker has a question. Um, so let me, let me rattle off a couple of peer-reviewed scientific facts that I have before me, and I would like your opinion on those. I understand that last November was the globe's 333rd month of above-average global temperatures. To, to put that in perspective, that would mean that if you are 27 years old today, you have never experienced a month with a global temperature below the uh, average. You have a question, so, Senator Ranker? Yeah, I asked okay. it in the beginning. Thanks. I want to know his opinion on this. And then the second one is that, uh, again, peer-reviewed data here. We Senator Ranker, we're, we're gonna, we'll come back to that one later. Yeah, we're going to let Dr. Easterbrook no, we'll so finish his presentation. I'm happy to answer you your question. But I'll show you some here, data and let me answer it for you. Because what you over. just put out in your slide goes yeah. contrary to the data that I have before me. So I'm just curious if what you're basing your metadata on, where your samples are taken from, and then also what's your opinion of the data that I have before me, which seems contrary to what you're putting forward. I don't doubt that it's contrary. And what I, what I just said a moment ago was that I'm showing you the original data, and what you're looking at is the data that has been tampered with by NOAA and by NASA. And I could, I could show you curves of what that data looked like in 1936, what it looked like in 1980, what it looked like in 1990 and 2000. And the temperatures, the high temperatures in the 1930s get cooler every year. They put out a new issue. And the temperatures that are in the 2000 plus uh, get warmer because they have, they have frankly tampered with the data. That's the difference between what you're looking at and what I'm looking at, minus the original data. One quick follow-up, Mr. Chair. Data. That's the difference between what you're looking at and what I'm looking at. Mine is the original data. One quick follow-up, Mr. Chair. Sure. So the National Science Foundation, NASA, and NOAA have manipulated the data. Yes, that's true. I can show you the, I can show you the data that they, that they have manipulated. I'm, I'm not saying that um, they have done something uh, which is scurrilous and, and evil. What I'm saying simply is something that everybody will agree on, and that is that they have what they call adjusted the data. And if you look at how they have adjusted it, the 1930s always get lower because of the adjustments they made from the original data, and the 2,000 plus always get warmer. That's the case. And, we, and I, I can show you uh, data that will, that will indicate that if you like. Thank you. Right. Uh, here is a, a curve of, of what's called a heat wave index. Uh, these are for really hot times. And uh, again, simply to point out what I was mentioning a moment ago, the, the heat wave index for 1936 is right here. Uh, and look at the, the period of 1930-1940 relative to where we are now. This again confirms what I have just said, that the 1930s were warmer than they are right now. We had more heat records broken, we had higher temperatures, it was a hotter decade. Um, and th there's hard data for, for all of that. Uh, we hear about droughts. We had a, we had a drought uh, last year in the summer in the Midwest, which was um, not a good thing, devastating. These things happen. Uh, this is a what's called a, a drought index, and uh, the down um, trending curves here, which are colored yellow, uh, are times of, of drought when the um, rainfall is below normal and green is wet. 
And so if you just look at uh, from about 19, roughly 1980 something uh, up to about 2000, you'll see that actually there's more, there are more wet times than there are dry times. This is not an ongoing drought. And if you look also at the duration of the drought, uh, you'll find they generally last two to three years, something like that. And then they move on. So the drought this summer, last summer, uh, was bad. There's no doubt about it. Uh, it did a lot of, it cost a lot of farmers a lot of money, but it wasn't in any way unusual. Uh, again, uh, more data that looks at the relationship uh, between temperatures. Um, th this is the, the count of hot temperature records set, uh, similar to, to the data I just showed you, 1930s um, were uh, by far greater than, uh, than recently in, in the, the past couple of decades. And look at the relationship to CO2. There is no correlation whatsoever to CO2. And in fact, uh, this big hot spell in the 1930s occurred before CO2 began to rise, and so it cannot have been caused by CO2, and then we've had some cooling in between and then another warm period. There's nothing mysterious about global warming. It happens all the time. That's not the issue. The issue is what's causing that global warming. Uh, and, and the same thing is true if you take almost any place. Uh, here are 100 degree days compared to CO2 for New York City. Again, there's no relationship between CO2 and the number of hot days in, in, in New York. So the conclusions are that 80% um, of all maximum temperature records were set prior to 1960, before accelerated human CO2 emissions began in 1945. Thus, the present conditions, the present um, warming, or the recent warming, has nothing to do with CO2. Present drought conditions in the Midwest are part of a normal weather pattern. This is weather, not climate. Um, climate is generally taken to be a period of about 15 years or so. Uh, weather is day to day, year to year, whatever. So if you're looking at an annual number, that's weather, it's not climate. And so uh, what we're looking at when you see a severe storm or a period or, or an unusually cold or, or warm winter or summer, um, what you're looking at is really is weather has, and uh, is not related to um, global clim climate. Uh, weather extremes happen all the time regardless of what the climate is doing. And the present drought conditions are not as severe as those in the 1930s, the warmest decade of the century before CO2 level. So what happened to global warming? I mentioned earlier that global warming stopped in 1998. And my guess is you probably have never heard that because the press will not print anything which is adversely uh, related in any way to uh, CO2 as a cause of a climate change. But here's the real data. Uh, the graph on the left-hand side is temperature on the left-hand axis and year. This is satellite data. This is the best data we have. Um, it is untampered, unadjusted. It is uh, taken from real readings from satellites, and it gives a good overall global average. Uh, this peak right here um, is 1998, and since then it has gone down, came up a little bit, and is, as, uh, in recent years has been on a sharp downward bend. And I'll show you what the overall trend is for the decade in a moment. And that is confirmed by ground measurements. These are, are mostly ground measurements. The top two here uh, are satellite measurements compared to ground measurements, which are these lower three colors right here. And you can see the shape of the curve is essentially the same. So the ground data and the satellite data essentially agree that we have indeed had global cooling uh, for the last uh, um, decade or two. Here's the trend. Trend means the rate at which it's getting warmer or cooler. So beginning about 1998, which is right here, this is the trend. Down is colder, up is warmer. Look at the downward trend uh, between 1998, and this only goes to 2004, but it's continuing on down. Uh, here is, these are winter temperatures for the U.S. And again, look at the same trend. Starting about uh, 2001, the average winter temperature is going down at about minus four degrees um, during this period. That's the, that's the trend. It's getting colder at a rate of about four degrees. Uh, another plot of that same sort of thing, again showing the green line here, cool is down, warm is up. So again, showing a cooling trend uh, since about 2001. And all the while this is going on, we hear in the headlines that global warming is accelerating and it's getting hotter and hotter. And in fact, it's getting cooler and cooler. 
Here are winter temperatures uh, for the past decade, from 2000, I should say from 2001 to 2010-11. Uh, in, the, in the north central states, it's eight degrees cooler per decade. Uh, the same in, in the, in the uh, north central area, um, and they range all the way from about uh, two in the Pacific Northwest, minus two to minus three uh, in the southeast. All of them, however, are colder. It's not getting warmer in the winter, it's getting colder in the winter. This is NOAA data. I'm uh, sorry, this is NCDC, that's NASA data. Make your pardon. Hey, Dr. Eastberg, Senator Ranker has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Two questions, if I may. Uh, the first one is, have you taken into account uh, uh, volcanism, uh, solar radiance, and other factors such as that in your data? Have you removed those from the picture? Or uh, which I didn't understand. Uh, the, like, volcanic events, solar radiance, and other issues like that, have you taken those into consideration when accumulating your data? Yes, but this data doesn't, this speaks only to the temperature change. It doesn't speak to the cause. And we can talk about the cause later, but the answer to your question is yes, I've considered those in great detail. I work with, I work with um, some solar physicists, some atmospheric physicists, uh, some astronomers, and we all agree on what's happening with the solar. Uh, in terms of volcanic activity, I'm a geologist, and I, I can um, judge that for myself. And I can tell you that volcanic events are very short. They're like little punctuation marks here and there. They don't persist. They're not a factor. They give you a, a one-year, two-year spike, and then they're gone. Okay, so in the follow-up, and, and this gets back to uh, the data I have before me, which seems, again, contrary, but uh, so w you're talking about a trend, particularly over the last decade, maybe 15 years of cooling, yet what I have before me is that 2000 to 2012 was the warmest 12-year period in instrumental record. In other words, since we've been recording heat of the planet and, the, and what we're in, the last 12 years were the hottest on record. And that's peer-reviewed data that I have before me. And so my question to you is, is, is that because what I'm looking at is, has been manipulated by NASA and NOAA and the National Science Foundation? Or what, what's the difference here? Because we obviously have conflicting information before us. Right. I, I don't know what, what your data is or, or where it came from, so I can't answer that specifically of why it's different. What I can tell you is that the data that I'm showing you is original data, and as I've just shown you, the 1930s were warmer, uh, were warmer decade than the, than the uh, past decade, if you use original data. That's right. different than that. My guess would be, although without knowing what your data is, I can't say for sure, is probably that this is manipulated data by NOAA, NASA, or the sub, um, subunit of, of NASA that deals with climate. And um, what they do uh, is they make what they call adjustments to their data, the net effect of which is to make the earlier warm periods, like the 1930s, cooler and raise the temperature of the last decade artificially. Uh, not from the original data. Mine is original data. Is this a conspiracy? Uh, I'm not into conspiracy, so I have no comment on that. I'm simply a data purveyor, so I'm going to prevent you. I'm going to, I'm going to present you with data, and you can draw your own conclusions. You probably d didn't realize, if you watch TV news every year, that Europe is having the coldest winter in 100 years. I hadn't heard that. And I, I started looking up the data, and I, I, I'm aware that Moscow uh, is buried under six feet of snow. They're, they're having the coldest winter in 100 years. Moscow is virtually paralyzed. They had a traffic jam that was 100 miles long. Um, that's true of, of all of um, um, the, the central European area, uh, Germany, Poland, Russia, Norway, Sweden, and also Great Britain. This area is having the bitterest, snowiest, coldest winter in 100 years. So much for global warming. This is, this is uh, England, and, and England is having uh, the coldest, snowiest winter in about 50 years. They're uh, not quite as, as cold as, as this part of, of the country. 
you'll never see this on TV, although it's big news. And now the news media in parts of Germany, Poland, and, and parts of Russia are finally beginning to say, oh, yeah, that's right, it is the coldest winter. How can we have that kind of thing going on if we're supposed to have accelerating warming? Cold costs lives. Cold, cold is more dangerous than heat. Um, you kill more people in a cold winter than you do in a hot summer. And uh, in, in England this year, um, the coldest spring in 50 years, has. this is just in the spring, has cost 5,000 lives. 5,000 people died for causes that are attributable to cold. Um, and there are another 2,000 extra deaths in just the first two weeks of March. Um, 3,000 something in, in February. And the only point I want to make here is that cold is a greater enemy than heat, than warm. Warmth is good, cold is going to kill more people. So the conclusion is that global warming ended in 1998, and I, by that I mean modern, which is the, the warm period that everybody agrees on occurred between 1978 and 1998. Uh, there's been no global warming in 15 years. The temperatures have not exceeded those in 1998. Uh, and the, the um, global warming that took place between 1978 and 1998 has been replaced by global cooling for the past decade despite the fact that CO2 continues to rise. Uh, U.S. winters are, are cooling at a rate of minus 2 to minus 8 degrees during the past decade, again, inconsistent with global warming. Uh, that's because global warming ended in 1998, not to say there isn't global warming. Uh, temperatures today are not at all time highs. Um, most temperature records, as we were just pointing out, were set back in the 1930s, and the, most of the last 10,000 years has been warmer than it is right now. Um, the Antarctic ice sheet is growing, it's not melting, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this in a, in a minute and, and show you the data for that. We hear every day, or I hear every day, uh, accounts that, oh, the, the uh, polar ice caps are melting at an accelerating rate, and so we're all going to drown from rising sea level, and I'll show you the data for that. Uh, and as I said, most all the 10,000 years has been warmer than, than present. So let's address the question, are the polar ice caps melting? And here are a couple of quotes I'll just let you read for yourself. Um, and uh, th this is a, a, a magazine cover, polar ice caps are melting faster than ever. Well, uh, guess what? Uh, there's no polar ice cap at the North Pole. There's an ocean. There is no ice cap at the North Pole. So we don't have to worry about it. The, the ice there is only about three meters thick which is inconsequential in terms of the total ice of, of, the, of the continent. This is what it looks like. It's floating sea ice. There are no, glac there are no glaciers at the North Pole. Um, the Arctic sea ice fluctuates, the, the aerial extent. There have been times when it was warmer, and you could sail ships uh, across the Arctic Ocean. The Chinese did it in the 1420s. Um, and we hear a lot about the, the polar bears who are in trouble because the sea ice is, uh, is melting. Um, but what I can tell you is that the polar bear population has gone from 5,000 to 25,000 during that same period when the sea ice was supposed to be melting. And they survived 10,000 years of climate warmer than today, so they're going to be just fine. Let's look at the Antarctic ice sheet. And this is what you'll see in the headlines. It's melting at an accelerating rate. This is untrue. It's actually growing, not melting. Antarctica uh, consists of a continent with a huge ice sheet. This is the Antarctic ice sheet. It's about 15,000 feet thick at its thickest point. Uh, temperatures there are exceedingly cold. I'll show you those in a moment. There was a little arm right here called the, the West Antarctic Peninsula that has warm water around it, which has been uh, melting some of the floating ice there in recent years and causing some, of, some glacial melt. But this is a, a minuscule part of the total volume of ice that occurs on, on account of Antarctica. And the reason is that the average daily temperature in Antarctica is 58 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. The last winter temperature at South Pole reached 100, minus 106 degrees. To get any ice to melt, you would have to raise the average daily temperature from minus 58 to 32 degrees, which is the melting point of ice, plus another 10 degrees or so to get any appreciable melting to occur. You would have to warm Antarctica 100 degrees to melt the Antarctic ice cap. How likely do you think that is? I'll let you judge for yourself. It's not going to happen. The other thing uh, about Antarctica is that because of the um, situation 
uh, at the pole and the continental area, it makes its own weather. And there is a strong weather gyre that goes all the way around Antarctica. And the Antarctic ice cap has not disappeared in 15 million years, despite temperatures considerably warmer than we have today. Antarctic ice cap is not melting. We have ice cores through the ice cap that show us that there are no gaps in the ice record. If the Antarctic ice cap had melted before when temperatures were warmer, we would have gaps. We don't have them, which means that the Antarctic ice cap is exceptionally stable. It's much more stable than temperate glaciers. It's not going anywhere. Um, here is the record at the South Pole, which has been kept since 1957. This is the average, and you don't see any change in the, um, in the temperature at the South Pole. And there are two stations that record temperatures. One is the South Pole, and the other is Vostok, which is a Russian station. And they show the same thing, namely that there has been no warming in Antarctica uh, since records have been kept in 1957. Again, emphasize the point, the Antarctic ice cap is not melting. skip this in the interest of time and move directly to um, CO2 as a possible cause of significant global warming by itself. Dr. Eastbrook, uh, Senator Billick has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, when we're talking about the melting, um, how about glaciers? Because I've seen the, the empirical evidence of glaciers melting. So do you, do you disagree with that evidence or do you think that it's something other than uh, warming that's causing that? No, warming, certainly, I, I agree with that totally. And what I, what I have said uh, from the beginning is that we've had um, a number of periods of warming, cooling, warming, cooling. And the answer to the question is during periods of warming, of course they melt. During times of cooling, they advance, they grow. So glaciers grow, recede, grow, recede, grow, recede. And uh, we can look at the record in Greenland, for example, and we'll see that the, the record there, the temperature record there, is exactly the same as the global temperature record. And so the ice in Antarctica, uh, excuse me, the ice in Greenland was surely melting um, at, uh, at, a, at a different rate from 1978 to 1998 than it was during the cool period between uh, 1945 and 1977. So I'm, what I'm saying is, yes, global warming causes glaciers to melt. That doesn't prove what's causing it. I mean, hell, I had hair before, before uh, global warming. I don't, I don't make a cause and effect connection there, and you can't make a cause and effect connection just because CO2 happened at the same time to go up at the same time that, that the climate warmed, because in all these earlier periods, there was no CO2 factor, and, um, and it still got warmer. If I, if I really, thank you. Um, so, but you said the last 12 years we haven't been warming. So are you saying that that means that glaciers have not, not uh, melted in the last 12 years? No, not at all. Um, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, we have a very good record of the glaciers advance and retreat uh, during the past century. And from, from 1880 to 1915, glaciers advanced to almost their, their maximum position, uh, certainly in the last several hundred years, they advanced. From 1915 to 1945, they retreated like crazy at a rate probably greater than, than um, the, the last decade. And then in, in 1945, the climate got cooler, and they advanced again, and they advanced to, their posi to positions that were actually down valley in many cases from their earlier ones. And then it got warm again from 1978 to 1998, and it began to retreat again. And then since 1998, uh, many of the glaciers have stopped retreating, and some are starting to advance. This is true in Alaska, it's true in Scandinavia, it's true in some parts of South America. But not every glacier behaves the same way, so not every glacier is, is, has stopped melting. Thank you. It is the nature of glaciers to melt when the climate warms. Oops, let's go back here. Here's a critical question. Is CO2 capable of causing global warming? That's what underlies all of these discussions. And that's, that's the main contention of the, uh, of the whole climate uh, change debate. 
Uh, what you may not be aware of is that there's almost no CO2 in the atmosphere. It's very small. It's 39 one thousandths of one percent. If we take a bucket of air out of this room and measure it, we will get 39 one thousandths of one percent CO2. It's almost nothing. If you double nothing, you've still got nothing. Since 1950s, since this big escalation of emission of CO2, the composition of the atmosphere, the, the CO2 composition, has increased by only eight one thousandths of one percent. That's almost as close to nothing as you can get. You can triple that and you still have nothing. There is not enough CO2 in the atmosphere to do much of anything. And then you add to that that CO2 accounts for only 3.6 percent of the greenhouse effect. Only 3 percent of the greenhouse gas effect is CO2. 95 percent is water vapor. So the, the point of this is that CO2 by itself is incapable of significant global warming. That's the bottom line. I'll say it again. CO2 by itself is incapable of causing significant global warming. And so how do we get these, these, um, these projections in? And we get it because um, the climate modelers who, um, who depend on computer models rather than real data uh, for their conclusions um, have decided that if CO2 goes up, water vapor will also increase. And as water vapor increases, we kick in this 95% of the greenhouse effect. So virtually all of the temperature increase during the warm period we had in, in, in 77 to, um, to 98, virtually all of that they would account for by water vapor in their models, not CO2, water vapor. So the question is, is water vapor increasing? Well, here's water vapor. Here's water vapor going back to 1947. Water vapor, if water vapor is increasing as CO2 goes up, and that's what's causing, that's what's levering the global warming, then uh, you might have an argument for, the, for their models. But water vapor is actually decreased, has actually decreased since 1947. Look at the downward trend. Down is less water vapor in the atmosphere. And these are various levels of the atmosphere. So in order for their models to be correct, they must show that there has been an increase in water vapor in the atmosphere, and it's just the opposite. There is less water vapor in the atmosphere now as CO2 has gone up, not more, and so their models are totally invalid. Their models will not work without an increase in water vapor. There's another effect of CO2, uh, which is called a saturation effect. Um, if you take a, a dry sponge and dip it in a bucket of water, it'll soak up water. If you take a wet sponge and put it in a bucket of water, it doesn't soak up very much more water, does it? Because it's already saturated. And CO2 operates the same way. There's a saturation level wherein the, the CO2, which is in the atmosphere right now, is mostly saturated uh, with respect to capturing of, of the frequencies of, of heat. And so on this curve right here, uh, this is the degree in uh, possible temperature change with increasing in atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide, this 1950 level is right here, 2008 level is right here, the maximum amount of temperature change you could get from the increase in CO2 from 1950 when the whole thing started to escalate for emissions and now is less than one tenth of a degree. This is basic physics. What about just making a, a correlation between CO2 and temperature. Uh, on this curve, uh, this is atmospheric temperature, uh, excuse me, atmospheric CO2 on this uh, side and surface temperature uh, on this side. So here's the CO2 curve, um, which has been increasing, been going up steadily, no doubt about it. From 1915 to 1945, we had global warming with no increase appreciably in CO2. So CO2 didn't cause that warming in this century, hotter than it is now. And then when CO2 was escalating in 1945 on, we actually had global cooling. The curve is actually going the opposite direction of the CO2 curve. If CO2 causes global warming, why do we have 30 years of global cooling when it began to escalate? Doesn't make any sense. It's only in this last uh, period from 1978 to 1998 when the two have coincided by coincidence. Um, we can also show that um, Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere always follows an increase in temperature, not the other way around. 
the idea would be that if CO2 is causing global warming, CO2 would go up and then the temperature would go up, okay? But here's what actually happens. And these are, these are measurements that have been made by a group uh, of researchers in Norway. Um, the blue curve down here is temperature. Temperature's been going up and down, uh, as it does every few years, largely because of, of ocean changes. And this is the CO2 content of the atmosphere. In every case, temperature goes up and then CO2 follows. If CO2 was causing this temperature to go up, it should precede it, but it doesn't. It follows it in every case and by about the same amount. And this is for short-term changes. The same is true for long-term changes. So the conclusions about CO2 is that the amount of the atmosphere is minuscule. The total change is so small uh, that there is absolutely no way it can cause global warming by itself. It's totally dependent on water vapor. Uh, and there's no correlation between global temperatures and CO2. When CO2 goes up, temperature does whatever it wants to do. Um, the comparison of computer model predictions of global warming, um, when you compare those to actual measurements to see if the models were right, they are totally inaccurate. The models are totally inaccurate. And I'll show you uh, an instance of that in, in just a minute. The bottom line is CO2 is not capable of causing significant global warming by itself. That's clear from the physics. Um, CO2 is a result of global warming, not the cause of global warming. As you increase the temperature, you increase the CO2 in the atmosphere because there's more that's given up by the oceans. Dr. Eastbrook, you, yeah. you use the term um, greenhouse effect. 